Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. Yali Madad, and a very good morning to you all. It is my immense pleasure to welcome you all to the day, to day three of our college program on Islam. And as you all can see, today we have the honor of having Dr. Nargis Ali, Nargis Ali Virani with us. And before we start with our day, I would like to just introduce um, our program, our winter mini series, and what we will be talking about today. The college program on Islam began in the summer of 2002 for the Shia Ismaili Muslims. Emerging as a reaction to the events of September 11, 2001, the program directors responded to concerns of young Ismailis about how to articulate what it means to be Muslim. Seeking to fill in a gap in US universities and colleges, which lacked a strong Islamic studies program, CPOI became a place where Ismaili college students across the United States were able to access rigorous academic study of Islamic and Smiley studies. This winter, we decided that CPOI mini series should help us all gain the language and tools to grapple with the complexity of faith and the moral and ethical imperatives to engage in Islam as a lived faith and centering justice and promoting civil society. In addition, the series intends to present different perspectives and scholarly work that are representative of the topics at hand with an eye to encouraging reflection and further study. It also intends to present a series of scaffolded presentations that are also episodic in nature, allowing for easy entry into conversations. Meanwhile, for those who attend all the sessions, the topic will engage in an exploration of different levels of action from individual to community-based as a means to explore systematic impact over time. On our day three, we intend to explore the ritual practices in Islam with Dr. Nergis Ali Virani. We will try to explore the frameworks that link religious rituals to religious engagement through understanding the centrality of rituals to Islam understanding the roots of rituals and how these practices are formed and institutionalized. Now it is my pleasure to introduce our speaker for the day, Dr. Nergis Ali Virani, sorry, Alwaiza Dr. Nergis Ali Virani. Alwaiza Saiba received her MA and PhD with distinction in Arabic and Islamic studies from Harvard University. She graduated from the Institute of Smiley Studies first WTEP program with first class during which she acquired a postgraduate diploma in education and certificates in advanced Islamic studies from London University and in classical Arabic from Jordan University. She also holds a diploma in modern standard Arabic from University of Tunis and Bachelor of Commerce from Bombay University. Alwaiza Dr. Ali Virani has taught Arabic language, literature, Quranic and Islamic studies, women's studies and Middle Eastern films at University of British Columbia, Washington University in St. Louis and the New School in New York City for the past 25 years. She's currently an associate professor of Arabic in the Department of Middle Eastern and South Asian Studies at Emory University. Alwaiza Dr. Ali Virani served for 12 years on the American Academy of Religions Executive Committee on the status of racial and ethnic minority in the profession, which included four years as its chair. The American Academy of Religion is a 10,000 plus strong professional organization of scholars who teach religion in institutions of higher learning in North America and around the world. Simultaneously, she served in various positions in the Islamic section at the AAR and its committee on Islam, gender and women over the past three decades. In addition, she studied the Quran with the Sheikh of Al-Azhar and was awarded the Shahada certificate and the Ijaza permission to teach the Quran anywhere in the world. Alwaiza Dr. Ali Viradi has served the worldwide Smiley community as an honorary Alwaiza teacher and Waisin and teacher trainer and resource developer for the past four decades. She has also served one term each as a scholar on the national board of ITRAF for Canada and ITRAF for United States. 
Advisor Dr. Ali Barani has lately channeled her passion to instruct by leading educational and cultural journeys across, across Islamic societies for a group of individuals and families. She strongly believes that experientially engaged education provides one of the most powerful tools to learn from and absorb the human experience of diverse cultures and peoples around the world, particularly when undertaken intergenerationally. So far, she has traveled with groups to Morocco, Turkey, Egypt, Jordan, Jerusalem, Mecca and Medina for Umrah, and also to Iran, Bosnia, and India. Wow. Um, Alvaiza Saiba, it's such an honor to welcome you to our session. And I would also like to welcome all our participants to the day three of our college program on Islam. Um, Thank you. Thank you, Atash. I hope you can hear me, yeah? Yes, I can hear you uh, fine. All the participants and you all will have to just live with the, the voice that I have left. I came back a week ago from the Middle East, uh, spending two weeks in in Egypt and another week in Mecca and Medina, but came back with a, a terrible flu that I'm nursing still. I didn't want to let this opportunity go by, having made a commitment. Um, you have all had two days of foundational uh, sources in terms of the Quran. And Celine mentioned and showed you the backdrop of the Quran itself. Yesterday, you had Shainul Jiva talk about notions of authority. And today, I want to take that conversation further in terms of actual practice. I still want to give a little bit of a backdrop, and I will share my screen. Um, Atash, you can let me know if it's visible and everything. Yeah, we can see it fine. Super. Thank you. Um, so yes, I want to look at ritual practice in Islam, but I want to give it a, a greater backdrop in terms of how world faiths and even without faith traditions, people have looked at rituals. Perhaps it'll take some time for me to set it up. So you have beliefs and practices, the foundations of it, as you noticed some of the theological background logic of some practices that may be internal or external. Obviously, culture plays a very, very important part. And that is why we talk about Islamic eight societies, which may have been influenced by Islamic culture, irrespective of whether a majority Muslims live in that area. And that is something, a, a term that was coined by uh, Hodson, Marshall Hodson in the 60s. Some history and Perhaps I will end with Ismaili practices in general, and then in question answers, maybe deal with it specifically. Um, so I wanted to start with revelatory faiths and look at what that means in terms of scripture. When we do talk about revelatory faiths, we do have a scripture. And historically, in some way, ascertainable founder figure. And from the Islamic perspective, from the Quranic perspective, as you know, these are called people of the book, Ahl al-Kitab, uh, in which at the time, Judaism, Christianity, and Islam in the peninsula Arabia were the faiths that were known. And more than that, the Sabians are mentioned in the Quran. Of course, once Muslim conquerors and rulers come to a place like India and Southeast Asia, they do come across Hinduism, Jainism, Buddhism, Sikhs. And based on the very foundational belief of the Quran, that God does not leave any community without his guidance. A perpetual guidance is always guaranteed. Uh, one, it took some jostling, uh, some dynamics of understanding and to then look at Hinduism, Jainism, Buddhism, Sikhism, particularly Hinduism that may look on the outset or in the outside as an idolatrous faith, to look at it as the people of the book, which happens in Akbar's time. So in any case, whether one thinks of revelatory faiths as the Ahl al-Kitab, as the Quran describes it or stretches it further, 
religious communities can generally be divided and doing very general definitions here of a certain form of a book and certain tradition based theology and practices. My own area today is practice, but that book and tradition inspire a certain kind of theology upon which the practice is based. You have a different kind, which may be person-based theology and practices. And I want to mention that these two are not mutually exclusive. Often in most faith traditions, one will find that there is some form of combination of the above in theology and in practice. So the two words that I want us to think about are book and tradition-based, which yesterday Shandul talked about, that even here the authority and interpretation is important. So in world faith traditions in general, either there is a scripture and a mythology, if not a scripture directly attributable and ascribed a historical founder. So for example, generally, and I'm going very generally in simplistic terms, Judaism, we associate with Torah, the 10 commandments, the Hebrew prophets, Abraham, Moses, and many other patriarchs and figures. Christianity, similarly, we have the Bible, the New Testament, gospels, and the figure of Jesus. So here is the person, here is the book, here is the book, here are the people. Islam, we have the Quran, the prophet, Muhammad, who brings the revelation, and the Ahl al-Bayt for the Shias, very important people of the house. In Sikhi, or Sikhism as it is mentioned in Western sources, but not necessarily, you know, Sikhs call themselves Sikhi, that is a way of life. Sikh, the Guru Granth Sahib, and the Guru Gobindji, and many other gurus become very important. Similarly, in Hinduism, you have the Vedas, the Purana, Brahma, Vishnu, Shiva, the three figures, and various avatars. So you have a figure and the book of some sort mythology hand in hand. Book-based piety, when we talk about piety that claims to be book-based and its interrelationality with the person or the founding figure or beyond, since the book itself is non-speaking, non-interacting, there's always a tacit acknowledgement that an interpreter or interpreters are required. Whether you have you know, the Brahmanic class interpreting, the ulama interpreting, anybody needs to interpret that book because the book itself is a non-speaking, non-interacting. So either the individuals interact, which happens in Protestantism later, or you have certain interpreters. Nevertheless, within this system, the book is given primacy to the point of reification. The book is objectified in a way that is placed high up on the pedestal. It's not very different from how we in the US revere the constitution and what the founding figures meant when they wrote it. We have this discussion constantly in our public sphere about, you know, what did the founding fathers mean by this when they wrote it? How does one interpret it? Hence, you have this constant debate about the role of the Supreme Court, Scotus, and its purview, interpretive authority and validity. These are really important criteria, yeah? Interpretive authority and validity. Thus, the book-based religious piety and or political systems like the U.S. equally require persons to interpret what is in the Constitution, what is in the Quran, what is in the Torah, requires interpretation, requires an interpretive authority. So the question of authority, knowledge, and legitimacy becomes important, which I think was dealt with in great detail yesterday. So the rotating around multiple interpretation, which in turn are based on. So if the book is silent and the book is non-interactive, requires interpretation, whose interpretation? What is authoritative knowledge? 
who has it who is our legitimate interpreters that becomes an important criteria again which interpretations carry greater weight why and on what basis right you have all kinds of predicaments in history in geography uh, all kinds of circumstances that may play a role in it but there's always a question of what is an authoritative knowledge so if the whether the person is an alim you just heard my biography i need to have a certain credibility and certain authority and certain training and certain discipline to be able to speak on islamic studies the current way of doing that is to go and get a doctorate at a university right so here again what is authoritative knowledge who has it who are the legitimate interpreters which interpretations carry greater weight why and what basis so obviously during the time of the prophet this is not an issue he is the person he interprets the revelation people come to him and say muhammad o prophet of god please tell us what this means we don't understand even though it's in arabic and everybody speaks arabic we don't understand the import of this and the prophet would interpret so what you have here is what we saw yesterday a succession struggle but the question of authoritative knowledge authority knowledge and legitimacy continued this happens in all faiths not just islam so you know what happens the general accept acceptability and practice of these interpretations variously depend upon the knowledge the status charisma genealogy of this person their relationship with the founding figures of that faith tradition etc so you have several factors that become criterion for general acceptability by people or people that matter maybe not all the common people right so it depends upon the knowledge so yesterday we heard that imam jafar as sadiq imam al baqir imam jafar as sadiq decided that they will live a life of quiescent politically but their knowledge and their reputation for their knowledge went far and wide to the point that two sunni founders of two sunni legal schools abu hanifa and malik were students of imam jafar as sadiq there is a certain status there certain charisma of the person the genealogy of this person related to the prophet great grandsons of the prophet you know the founding figure of that faith tradition so you have all kinds of criterion and one could add to this as well certain pietistic practices may evolve around the person of these entities so as soon as these people are accepted variously having charisma maybe having genealogy having the knowledge the status a certain connection with the founding figure uh there may be certain pietistic practices may evolve around the person of these entities including offering a very foundational important connection which is an unconditional oath of allegiance the bai'a just as the early muslims famously gave their bai'a to the prophet as harkened in the quran surah fath 4810 as recited daily in the fourth part of the ismaili dua innal ladina yubayyunaka inna ma yubayyuna allah yadullah fawqa aydihim god's hand is upon their hand so you have a direct connection of this founder figure and when people give the bai'a they know that they're giving it unto god which the quran confirms and says god's hand is upon their head okay we also know in the ismaili tradition that this is what god nasir khusro looking for that hand so again a very important part of this connection of piety particularly person based piety is connected with all of these and certain practices may develop so in morocco this is a very common baraka muhammad muhammad is word person carrying baraka right again it's a majority sunni country you will not see this in saudi arabia today 
but certainly all over Morocco and particularly in S media, this is very common to have tiles. This is engraved in public buildings, particularly 18th century onwards, you have this Baraka Muhammad. The idea of certain persons then carrying in this stature, charisma is what I called it, but in Muslim terms that becomes the Baraka. So whether Sufi sheikhs, the Shia Imams, their Baraka, whether they are alive or dead, continue to bless their followers. Sorry. Now, what happens between these multiple interpretations and its enforcement of one or another form of belief and or practice? Often we hear these two words, orthodoxy and orthopraxy. I want to briefly talk about this. Doxy is belief, ortho is straight, upright. So one upright or straight belief to the negation of all else. The question always comes is who decides this and enforces it? Obviously I have a typo there. Who decides this and enforces it? Often historically we've seen their powers to be either religious, secular, political, which in the pre-modern times were not separate as we saw yesterday. These were powers that were fused together, religious, secular, political. And if they were in power, they enforced a certain kind of belief. We saw this in the Abbasid times, particularly often enough, we see this in Saljuk times and many other times in Islamic history and in our current times in terms of certain governments trying to impose uh, a certain kind of correct belief and what is often called praxis, practice. So in a lot of introduction to Islam kind of books, you will find often uh, John Esposito to many others, they will say that Islam should be identified not as an orthodoxy, which is where Christianity often may generally fall in, correct belief, but orthopraxy. Judaism and Islam are characterized by certain praxis, a certain practice of the faith. Belief is not enough. It needs to be put in practice. It's one thing for praxis. When one says orthopraxy, then one is saying there is only one and only one way of practice to the negation of all historical, cultural, traditional, geographic, and other diversities, because these diversities are seen as a weakness at best and threat at worst. So then you have to, you, certain powers to be will impose a certain kind of practice. This is the only way to practice the faith. This is the only way that Muslim women should dress up. This is the only way to say the prayers. This is the only way to enter the mosque. These are praxis related, but these practices historically have had their own cultural, traditional, geographic, and other diversities expressed, just as I showed you in one tile, Baraka Muhammad, in Morocco. Anywhere you go in the Islamic world and Islamic hate world, you will see this diversity staring you in the face. And at the same time, people will talk about some kind of orthopraxy. So we have very interesting examples in, in Fatimid times. Um, Abu Hatim al-Razi writes about orthopraxy and the five pillars and says, you know, orthopraxy is from whose vantage point? It's a very important question to ask. Orthodoxy or orthopraxy from whose point of view? Every believer in their own place considers their belief and their practice as ortho. It's somehow certain coincidences and, you know, all kinds of vagaries of history and geography that force people into believing in one way. But at the same time, the believer themselves. So he says, from whose perspective? And we have seven pillars. Vilaya, the devotion, 
and tahara. These are two additional, right? Purification and love and devotion for the family of the prophet and the imam of the time is part of the foundational orthopraxy, right? So I wanted to just briefly bring this up. I want to move, I want to shift gears now. And if you can shift gears with me. So we've talked about book tradition-based theology that you talked about two days ago or yesterday and the day before. And today I want to take that into further into practice, but still book and tradition-based, which in Islam we call Ahla Sunna wal Jama'a, from which the word Sunni comes. Ahl Sunna, the tradition and the community. Right? And at the same time, then these give rise to pietistic practices or devotional practices. So I wanted to clarify shift gears in the sense of what do, what do rituals mean, which is my topic today. Right, not R-I-G-H-T, but R-I-T-E, right, is a formal religious ceremony often. Rite of passage, birth, marriage, death. A ritual, on the other hand, is a prescribed method for performing a religious ceremony, often in congregation, but also by oneself. So there's a prescribed way of doing things. Now, from ritual comes the adjective ritualistic. And we can talk about it further in discussion. Something is also important is a routine, right? So I can say I have a nightly ritual before I go to bed or have a routine, some kind of a standard established action performed normally, habitually, commonly, nothing unusual about it. I brush my teeth, I floss my teeth. Is that a ritual? So often in common parlance, ritual and routine can become fused, but they're not. So some definitions of ritual from an anthropological perspective, what is a ritual? A ritual is a set of actions performed mainly for their symbolic value. It may be prescribed by the traditions of a community, including by a religious community. The term usually refers to actions which are stylized, excluding actions which are arbitrarily chosen by the performers. So if you're in a congregation and there is a ritual, you can't arbitrarily choose to do something else there is a prescribed action that you do together. The purposes of rituals are varied with religious obligations or ideals, satisfaction of spiritual or emotional needs of the practitioners, strengthening of social bonds, social and moral education, demonstration of respect or submission, stating one's affiliation, obtaining social acceptance or approval for some event or sometimes just for the pleasure of the ritual itself, right? So there is a bodily embodied performance here. It is a set of actions. They have symbolic value. And who gives that value? Perhaps some history of that particular ritual, perhaps some understanding, some devotional act besides it, uh, all kinds of things, right? It may be some tradition of the community that then became part of that ritual. The purposes of rituals are varied. With religious obligation or ideals, it may be a satisfaction of certain spiritual or emotional need of the practitioners. It may be strengthening of social bonds, social and moral education, demonstration of respect or submission. So I want to give you a minute to look at this. <laughs> sometimes, don't forget that last line, sometimes just for the pleasure of the ritual itself. I want to give you some examples. Rituals are not limited to humans. 
culture only. Many animal species, as anthropologists have observed, use ritualized actions to court or to greet each other. Many of you watch National Geographic channels know this, right? So you have animals used to court or to greet each other or to fight. At least some ritualized actions have very strong selective purposes in animals. For example, ritualized fights are extremely important to avoid unnecessary strong physical violence between conflicting animals. So that's one of the observations that's made. Now the question is, are rituals rational or are they just rote, right? This idea of ritualistic. Some of the research, and I'll give you some, uh, you know, the, the, the links to it. Recent research suggests that rituals may be more rational than they appear. Why? Because even simple rituals can be extremely effective. Rituals are formed after experiences, experiencing, excuse me, I'm having, I'm trying to take all kinds of lozenges so I can speak, but it's affecting my ability to speak. Rituals performed after experiencing losses from loved ones to lotteries. You know, I bought a lottery, I never got anything. So that's a loss, though I never had that money anyway, right? To alleviate grief and rituals performed before high pressure tasks like singing in public do in fact reduce anxiety and increase people's confidence. So we all have all kinds of rituals to deal with, um, with you know, anxiety, with pressure, right? Uh, in Indian cultures, I don't know how many of you, if you're very young, you may not know this, but our mothers used to give us dahi before we went for exams. That was something that they did, right? You got, you got niyas, you got dua, and you said dahi khake jau, right? That was, that was a ritual before an exam. I have no idea where that came from, but they seem to have an effect. What's more, rituals appear to benefit, this is very interesting, to benefit even people who claim not to believe that rituals work. While anthropologists have documented rituals across cultures, this earlier research has been primarily observational. Recently, a series of investigations by psychologists have revealed intriguing new results demonstrating that rituals can have a causal impact on people's thoughts, feelings, and behaviors. And we do a lot of work in religious studies with this kind of embodied practice. What is religion and what is embodied practice, right? So even people that don't believe it works, it seems to have some impact on one's thoughts, feelings, and behaviors, right? How does it work? So here are some examples of older research. Humans, power of rituals when feeling completely out of control. This is one area where human beings have used all kinds of rituals. When humans feel uncertain and anxious in a host of situations beyond laboratory experiments and sports like charting new terrain. In the late forties, and some of you may be aware of this research, anthropologist Melnowski lived among the inhabitants of islands in the South Pacific ocean. When residents went fishing in the turbulent shark infested waters beyond the coral reef, they performed specific rituals to invoke magical powers for their safety and protection. When they fished in calm waters of a lagoon, they treated the fishing trip as an ordinary event and did not perform any rituals. So this idea of out of control, when things are out of control, then human beings seem to develop some kind of ritual to allow for hearkening, uh, calling something about them. So Malinowski suggested that people are more likely to turn to rituals when they face situation where the outcome is important and uncertain and beyond their control, as when sharks are present, right? Think about all kinds of rituals that have to do with, with people passing away, mourning, all kinds of mayat rituals, right? This idea of uncertainty, of not knowing what is beyond. Rituals in the face of losses, such as the death of a loved one or the end of a relationship are ubiquitous. There is such a wide variety of known mourning rituals that they can even be contradictory. Crying near the dying is viewed as disruptive by Tibetan Buddhists, but it is a sign of respect by Catholic Latinos. Hindu rituals encourage the removal of hair during mourning, while growing hair in the form of a beard is a preferred ritual for Jewish males as mourning, okay? So they may be contradictory. Do rituals work? 
people perform morning rituals in an effort to alleviate their grief, but do they work? Research suggests that they do. Just as there are multitude of grief rituals all over the world, so too are there are numeral, innumerable rituals related to feasting, ranging from cultural, a Japanese tea ceremony to personally quirky, eating all the green MMs first. I don't know if anybody does that. I know that if my daughter's on this, she's going to tell me why did you say this, but she always creeps her best meat piece or the shrimp or the fish, fish piece last to eat. That's her ritual, right? And so, you know, these quirky personal rituals, right? Given that there are so many rituals associated with food, and I particularly bring food here because we do have within our rituals several rituals with food, from Sukri to Mehmani to Nandi to Jura. All of these are fruit food related rituals, whether rituals could even make food taste better. Okay. So in heaven, inherent power of ritual. In one experiment, participants were asked to eat a chocolate bar. Half of the control group performed an assigned ritual, breaking and unwrapping the bar in a particular way. Before eating it, the other half just ate the bar unceremoniously. On average, those in the ritual group reported the candy to be more enjoyable and more flavorful than the non-ritual group. A follow-up experiment showed that participants in the ritual experiments actually thought the chocolate bar was worth more money. They were willing to pay four to five times more money for the same candy because they had gone through this ritual than those in the non-ritual group thus showing the retail marketing potential for food-related rituals. So some of you in retail marketing, you probably know this research more than I do. But here it is. If you have a certain ritual, think of all the commercials on television. So when you have every faith tradition has something to do with food, food that is in the temple, the mosque, uh, the synagogue, the church, you know, the sacrament, all of those food rituals, they are highly stylized, highly controlled and participating in it. And it's not just a wafer and a sip of the wine. It's not just a jura that you put in your purse. There is a whole host of baraka that is assumed from that kind of food and rituals make it powerful. So these researchers thought, well, chocolate everybody likes, right? So of course they'll give more value. So they put something less imagined, you know, less exciting like carrot. Sure enough, even their participant who performed a series of gestures before consuming the carrot reported more enjoyment than those who just ate them. So those of you who are vegans, try this, okay? Here we are. You can try the carrot, more ritual done. Now, of course the Buddhists would call it, you know, mindfulness, right? We call it mindfulness today but the idea of a ritualized, stylized way of living. Now, this is also extremely important. Observation versus participation. Another experiment showed that observing a ritual is not nearly as powerful as performing a ritual. Participants who prepared a glass of powdered lemonade in a ritualistic manner, stir for 30 seconds, wait for 30 seconds, and so on, enjoyed, consume, enjoyed consuming it much more than who merely watch someone else prepare the lemonade, right? So active participation in a ritual versus observation of it had a completely qualitative difference. So this is the first time I understand why people fight to get Sukrit making varas. I can make Sukrit, but I know that women die to get that vara. So here is this whole question of participation and what goes into that making of the Sukrit, the prayers that go into it. So enjoyment of being involved. With grief, the ritual leads to a feeling of control, Norton says, and I'll give you the, uh, the, the reference. With consumption, rituals seem to work because they increase your involvement in that experience, okay? With, with grief, there is a certain feeling of control, whatever the prayers would be to, to work on your grief. So these are the two people. Uh, they're professors at Harvard Business School, or at least were when I did this research. And they have a book, Why Our Decision Get Derailed and How We Can Stick to the Plan. Okay. 
Now, Terry Pratchett, another scholar, talks about ritual and ceremony in their due times kept the world under the sky and the stars in their courses. As you look at primordial kind of religion, as Imam Sultan Shah also talks about this in the memoirs, that people looked up, you know, the stars and the skies, and somehow for them not to fall before we understood that they won't fall, there were prayers to be recited, otherwise it would be a disaster, right? So they kept them in their courses. Rituals like weddings, funerals, baptisms, vigils are powerful experiences for participants. By adapting sacred and symbolic elements, one can use the power of ritual to give your actions greater depth and power. So here you have these symbolic actions that make a law. Now, it is easy to dismiss rituals as just the historical trappings of ancient religions, which, you know, uh, on the first day, uh, Salim Ibrahim talked about the Sasanian and the Byzantine Empire, right? And right in the middle is the Peninsula Arabia. That place is not devoid of other religious traditions, including pagan religious traditions. In fact, the entire, every single aspect of the Hajj and the Umrah, every ritual that we performed, and I just performed last week, is actually was performed before the Prophet's time, and it goes back to Hazrat Ibrahim alayhi salam. But even during the pagan phase of Peninsula Arabia, those rituals were performed. Meaning may have been different. And once the Quran and the Prophet reauthorized these rituals, connecting it to Abraham, and Abraham being the Hanif, the believer in one God, all of the rituals, again, got a different meaning, okay? Kaaba becomes the place of the one God, Baitullah, every ritual. But they are part of all of these. So it's easy to sometimes historical trappings of ancient religions. But something very beautiful, but having little relevance to our times, nothing can be further from truth, okay? So we look at it. Now, I have this one slide, and I am going to stop because I know Atash is eager for me to, to give some time for discussion. So I have looked at Ismaili beliefs and practices and put them, oops, into a certain category, right? I can give greater detail, but the idea that we have a practice that is, that is essentially, yes, book and tradition based, no doubt about it, but it's also a person-based piety, essentially based on the bay'ah. I talked about the bay'ah, the oath of allegiance that the Muslims, early Muslims gave to the Prophet as their unflinching loyalty to the Prophet. And the Shias continue that with the Imam. So based on that, certain parts of our practices are person-based. Foundation of Ismaili practice is the bay'ah. This is the special relationship of murid, murshid, spiritual parent and child, guide through worldly and spiritual life, right? So within that, under general rubric, we talked about rituals. We talked about how rituals bring meaning and greater enjoyment. They have the power in and of itself. They allow for the mind, the body, the emotion, the spirit, the soul to come together in a certain way that the physicality allows for that. To say that the physical aspect is not important is something we can discuss. But I come from a school where I believe that the physicality allows for all other engagement and a deepening of engagement. And that is what Shia Islam stands for, right? So we have certain rituals under the general rubric. We have seeking forgiveness. But this seeking forgiveness is literally based on a prerequisite, which is extending the requisite generosity to forgive others to be able to earn forgiveness, right? So I cannot ask for forgiveness and say, Tobo, Tobo, Taksirdar, Bandha, Sarta, Pagunegar, I'm sorry. I am imperfect and please forgive me, but I harbor all kinds of ill will 
towards the other, right? So we have dua karavi, chata, specific prayers, including for the deceased. Now, each of these make a difference depending on one's own circumstances, one's own maturity. I can, I can participate in a Rouhani dua and I may not know the person and I will certainly with all sincerity say Amin. But if a family member has passed away, my engagement, my involvement, emotional and every level of engagement is going to be much more heightened, right? Similarly, if I'm taking a Rouhani Chata, it's a very specific prayers. It makes all of this seeking forgiveness. So the general ethos is asking for forgiveness, but extending generosity, expressing gratitude. I mean, in new age work, we all know how gratitude works. Without gratitude, nobody can live, literally. And if you are, you're a very depressed person because you are not grateful, right? So one of the ways to express or to allow for counting one's blessings is through shukrana and submission, whether that comes to the physicality or actually going all the way down to say sijda and doing the submission or sending a mahmani submission, shukrana tasbi or praying. Then we have a certain set of rituals that are seeking purification and what I call here becoming humane human or humane, seeking purification, right? So often this is related to water in all world faiths, all kinds of rituals that are related to water and purification of that. Abe Safa, Sukri, Chata, of course, comes in there as well. Personal prayers, is seeking purification and becoming humane or allowing what, what the Iranians would tell us in Rafi Keshavji's work that I, I bring here, um, he, he talked about, you know, what is it that makes one an Ismaili? And he, one of the predominant responses that he heard was that God has created us as Adam, or Hava, Adam, as a, as a male or female person. To become insan is the journey that we undertake during our time from Adam to insan. So human, becoming human, I know is now, you know, the blogs and it's important, but this idea of humane. Foundational ways of search for blessings and abundance. So our faith provides us all kinds of rituals that are within this person-based piety. They are, in my understanding, they are foundational ways of search for blessings and abundance through the person of the prophet and the imam, seeking baraka worldly and spiritual. We do this through Mahmani, through the son, this idea of seeking blessings and abundance. The Quran has, I could give you many, many verses of Quran where the Quran talks about giving it to the prophet so your the rest of your <coughs> the rest of your earnings become pure to so zakihin. <coughs> and get barak. There are other ways for, of search for blessings and abundance with the Imam of the time has opened for us, which is all kinds of charity, okay, through AKF, AKDN, participation in community building by offering TKN, resources, talent. All of this has a primary Shiite hallmark, which is intellectual, personal, spiritual search. Right? So all of these in terms of the rituals, which have a combination of tradition of the book, scripture, and person-based as it was during the time of the prophet, we have this final, these seeking forgiveness, generosity, gratitude, purification, becoming humane, searching for blessings and abundance, that is what in some ways I can encapsulate most of our rituals. So Atash, I'm going to stop there and let you take over. Thank you so much, Alvaiza Saiba. Um, first of all, for sharing um, the academic research, like insights from academic research. And I believe it's very important because when we say we have an intellectual tradition or we are followers of intellectual tradition, I think part of it means that we explore these rituals, these concepts through a journey. So it shouldn't be like, 
a person, a Jamaati member coming to an Alwaiza or an Alwais and just asking for like a fatwa. You know, it should be more exploring that. And I think these conceptual frameworks that we have provided are a very good way of getting started in that journey. So as you can imagine, we have received a lot of questions from our Jamaat, from our participants. Um, the first one that I would like to ask is, you mentioned that sometimes there are rituals performed by individuals or community to be in control. Wow. When things are so bigger than them, they're out of control. Um, but do you think when we articulate this idea um, in this way or the importance of ritual in this way, it almost sounds like people are giving into some sort of superstitious act. Um, how would you respond to that? That it is, is it a superstition or it is not? So depends on how one defines superstition, right? I think it's very important. Um, you know, we, we generally talk about superstition as, as something that, that people have no logical reason for being, right? So some kind of myth, belief, old wise tale, uh, magic, maybe even sorcery, all kinds of historically superstition has been attached with that. I think the, the religious understanding of uh, what is foundational in my understanding is awe, the word awe, A-W-E. And it's not the modern parlance in which we say awesome to just about everything, uh, but awe as as something that just completely baffles human mind, human intellect, and is beyond one's comprehension. Even if you think of 2000 universes, God is beyond that, right? That's the kind of awe that allows for a certain submission. That submission, depending on the temperament of the individual, can lead to what we would call some kind of superstitious beliefs. But one person's superstitious belief can be the other person's complete submission is what I believe, right? So, you know, we, we have cultural, culturally engendered superstitious beliefs, the black cat. Recently, when I was in Egypt and cats are all over, as most of you know, in the Muslim world, in, in mosques and everywhere, the idea of a black cat crossing your path and spoiling your day as it would be in Indian culture, doesn't even occur to people there, right? Because cats are considered the favorite of the prophet and they are ubiquitous in, in Turkey. And there are, there's a whole book on Istanbul cats, I believe. So this idea of, of superstition uh, is often used by uh, what I call the orthodoxy, orthopraxy uh, policing that goes on, which does not like necessarily the personal engagement of people with their faith because that is empowering for the individual but disempowering for centralized institutions and there is some value to it so i think that the the notion i love jo joseph campbell's you know uh, years ago i used to watch and um, you know one of his the favorite expression from the vedas he was saying is when, when you're out there in nature and suddenly you see something, whether it's a sunrise, sunset, something, a flower blossoming, and the moment your, your heart or your mouth says, ah, that is the deepest act of faith. That is awe. And in that kind of awe, then we have Ibn Arabi and all of them talking about being just completely awestruck, even in that personal experience of God. And without that, the rituals become a, a link, a bridge to somehow touch, you know, that or some entity, whatever it is, and somehow establish a connection, a very personal connection. So I don't know if, if that makes sense. Yeah. Um, Saiba, we have noticed that among the younger generation, there is this tendency to think about or conceptualize their approach as I am spiritual, not religious, <laughs> right? You have, you have heard this, we've all heard this in TV yeah. shows as well. 
And sometimes in religious traditions, when the rituals, when um, aspects of piety are strongly regulated, like for example, even in Jamaat Khana, we have a sequence of what is supposed to happen, mm -hmm. right? And when sometimes people do not measure up to those sequence, to those piety levels, um, they are judged um, as not pious people. So uh, how do you think one can respond to the younger generation or even anyone in the Jamaat who feels that this regulation of rituals affects their engagement with those rituals? It shouldn't be too much regulated. How would you respond? So there are two aspects to this. There is a personal and then there is a congregational. And one needs to separate those two. When one is in even a group of four people, one doesn't always get to do what one wants to do. You always give in, you know, and, and there is a give and take that happens. When you have a certain aspect of congregational practice, then it is often determined by institutions or or majority of the individuals as to how that gets carried out. This congregation is made of people with all kinds of greatnesses and weaknesses that can be judgmental and you can be judgmental about, about, about them as well, right? So it's not that other people are judging you for falling short of that. You can be judgmental about them being so literalist as well, right? So you have that going, but in a congregation, there are certain disciplines that must be adhered to in some ways for the proper running and proper uh, you know, implementation of things. Again, yes, I agree that you know, when it's taken to an extreme, it can become extremely annoying at the same time. I often say when people come to me and say, can I do this? But you know, Mukhya Nima will not accept this or Mukhi Sahib will not accept it. I say that yes, they have their guidelines and there are certain guidelines according to which the community works. And th those are institutionally mandated. But your faith is beyond that. It is far greater than that. So the individual must in Islam, amal bin niya. The Prophet, the hadith, innama amal bin niya. All action is based on your niyat, on your intentions. So if you have an intention of praying for someone who's not an Ismaili, you have the intention, your faith has not stopped you. The faith is broad enough. But if you insist that you absolutely have to do it in the way you would do it for an Ismaili, for example, to send a memani for this person or to, to have a name there, that person has not had a bay'a relationship. So within the congregation, there are limitations. It does not mean your faith is narrow or parochial or, you know, or, or not or limiting in some ways, but there is a general ethos of a congregation. But my faith has never stopped me from, from praying for this person. But if I insist and impose upon a congregation that this is the exact way I want this to be prayed, then that is problematic. So I think the individual and the congregation and the community and the institution and with the current Imam, the Imam of the time who chooses to work through the institutions in the constitution, then that is something we have given the bay'ah for. And therefore within that context, things can get quite formalized, but formality in all faith traditions the ritual aspects are always formal. In fact, in many faith traditions, you can't even perform it. In Hinduism, you would have to have a priest perform on your behalf. You cannot go and perform it, right? A full female cannot lead a prayer in Sunni Islam or Shia Islam generally, but we can. So most faith traditions have those limitations. And I think that it is it serves us well to think about what congregational ethos means what personal ethos means, what my personal and special relationship with the Imam means and act within that context in each, just as we have a dress code. I don't go to an evening party wearing something really casual. 
you know, I'd be kicked out. Similarly, in congregation, there are ethicalities. There is the ethics of allowing other people also to, to have the best experience. So each one is responsible for that. Now, not everybody is because we're all made up of human communities and some people will fall short, but that doesn't allow us to fall short of it. So I think that the best way I have been able to sort of navigate personally is to understand that within congregation, if I choose to be a part of it, because my tradition tells me, my imam tells me, there are hadiths of the prophet that say that congregational prayers are far more beneficial than personal prayers. Even if my head is wandering around in a car or at home, when I am in a space where 25 other people or 2,500 other people, let's assume 10% are concentrating. 250 people of those are concentrating. I can benefit from that. And that's probably what is meant by the prophet saying 27 times more benefit than at home. There's always barakah for prayers. The imam has left our doors open. But in that congregational prayer, if I want that barakah, because it is a human congregation, it's going to come with some price, quote unquote, which I should be ready to pay and I should be adhering to it, is where I come from. Um, thank you so much. Uh, we are over time, but one last, and I would request a brief response from you. A lot of our Jamaat <laughs> members sometimes do not fully appreciate the meaning or the essence of a ritual that they are performing um, in Jamaat Khana or in our Tariqa. What would you suggest? How can they learn more about that particular ritual to, you know, make their engagement better <laughs> or more beneficial for themselves? I'm actually so glad you asked that question because I actually had a slide, a slide on that and I stopped in the interest of time to have some discussion. Uh, yes. Um, and I hope somebody's saving this, the chat. There's a lot going on that I can't keep up with. So please, I'd love to look at it, including people suggesting all kinds of recipes for my cold. So I really appreciate that, your love and your care. I really appreciate it. Coming to people not understanding the meaning, I think it is very important to understand that meaning making happens at the personal level, at the congregational level. There is a history, there is a tradition. And if one doesn't know the history or the tradition, that does not preclude one from making meaning, right? So yes, it's important to know the history of that part, maybe, right? But that same ceremony that goes into a different tradition of Ismailis in Syria, it's done in a very different way because the whole idea of that part never made it. Giving Abishafa at the door was what, how, how I experienced it, right? You get it as you go and people give it. Some people have it, they don't have it. Not the integrated ceremony that we have as part of the Jamaat Khanna practice. So I think that the history uh, helps. Sometimes we are too far away from the language, which in the South Asian tradition, the Ginanic corpus has a lot of the rituals that are explained, right? So Dua Karawi, you know, you come, come to Jamaat Khanna, fold your hands in front of the mukhi mukhi bhi uske samu juwe tab dua ke ra fal pura hove ya jab tum gatma aao right hai zinda bulao fal amra puri pao shah peer ka didar so hai zinda what does it mean what does it mean to fold your hands these are extremely important culturally oriented rituals right in that south asian tradition to fold hands meet something to ask for blessings, you fold your hands this way, right? You cannot just ask, give me something and you don't even have something to hold on to for it, right? So these become, this is the part of the embodied culture that I think allows for greater participation. Can one experience it even without that? As I showed, rituals have their own power. Others are doing it, you're doing it. But at the same time, when it hits you in a certain way, within your own circumstances, you know, and daily mushkil uh, asan may mean nothing. And the day your exam results are going to be out, it means a whole different thing, right? So meaning making is by the individual. And at the same time, in Shiite Islam, we are always encouraged to engage intellectually 
to understand. So we should always make an effort. But I would be the first person to say that if somebody were to impose and say, this is the only meaning of this ritual, then I'm sorry that person is wrong. Rituals have a life of their own, as I just mentioned for Umrah and Hajj, that new meanings are given by individuals every generation, every time. Even I myself, when I go for a certain ritual yesterday to today to tomorrow, my own particular personal circumstances and makeup will give a different meaning. So meaning making has to happen at the individual level. But at the same time, that thoughtful process has to happen. And that's the bigger challenge, that it doesn't become rote. I put my money, I do this and I leave, or I don't do it at all. That's the challenge to engage. And that is the hallmark of Shi Islam. That is the hallmark, that you do it, but you do it with thinking. Otherwise, you know, we have Imam Sultan Muhammad Shah's Farman that says, how many times are you going to touch your head to the floor? Even, a, a, you know, a, a rooster keeps banging on the, on, on the ground. And that means the rooster has had 100 sijdas. Does it really mean that? That's what you're doing without understanding when you do the sijda. So this mm -hmm. idea of engagement and understanding, or he would say, if you're fasting, you know, even an animal, if you, you know, shut off the mouth or bind the mouth of a cow, they're fasting too. What is fast really? Of your eyes, of your ears, of your nose, of your, your thinking. That is what is important. So for individuals, rituals are to make meaning, if they are able to engage with the language tradition, with the historical tradition, that may widen the experience, but it does not preclude them from making meaning and understanding it on their own terms and participating in it on their own terms. Thank you so much. That was very beautifully put. I appreciate it very much. And on that note, <clears throat> I would like to thank you, uh, Dr. Nargis Balani. Uh, for this wonderful session. It was an absolute treat for all of us to listen to the conceptual framework first and then the practical responses on our uh, tariqa rituals. And once again, to all our Jamaati members who participate across the three days, thank you so much for your participation. Uh, we enjoyed uh, your presence, your questions, and I sincerely apologize if we are still unable to respond to your questions, but you understand that we have to move to our next segment with our CPUI participants. So on that note, um, I appreciate- I want, to thank, I want to thank all the participants as well. This is, this is a, a, a day of, of trying to recuperate. And of course, in the US, it is MLK day. So uh, you know, you're sparing your valuable time with us. We really appreciate it very much. And you know, keep, keep adding to your knowledge and your participation. Thank you. Yeah, keep reading and please, uh, stay tuned to all of ITRAB and our programs. We really appreciate your presence and your feedback. Yeah. Uh, now we will transition into our small group session with Dr. Uh, Nergis Birani, and I hope and expect that all of our CPUI participants will join there. Once again, thank you so much. Yali Madad. Yali Madad.